This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Shake them ropes, Jeff Hawkins, Snoop Novi Nove. <laughs> Ain't nothing but a robe thing. Uh, here? Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Is there anything going on in the world of wrestling? Like, oh, I don't know. Comebacks. If you're if you're into the mid-aughts Ring of Honor, <laughs> this week's been great for you because all your favorites are coming back. Uh, Chris was at Monday Night Raw Live. Chris, any thoughts on your experience being part of the WWE universe? Hawkins, I'm going to take off the hood now. I, I wanted to put on the hood while you're doing the intro. Uh, now, now oh, you hold on. To... Hold on. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ben Kenobi. That's uh, yeah, a name I haven't like, heard yeah, in like Jedi Novembrino here. All right. So, um, yeah, uh, it was like it was really a weird feeling to go back to a, like a live event. This is the biggest live event that I've been to since this whole thing began. And on one hand, uh, especially given that this last month has been like a real shellacking on other fronts in my life. Like it was nice to just get my mind off of things and go to a wrestling show. Um, but on another hand, uh, like you get on the train um, some people are in a mask. Some people aren't a mask. I have my mask on. Okay. That's cool. Get to the event. I, we, we got there about 10 minutes late. So we missed John Cena, but I think kind of more conveniently, I missed like the grand entering of the building. There were very few people still entering the building by the time I got there, which was cool. Cause like most people weren't masked up and I don't like want to linger on that too much, but like I've heard other people say it looked like there weren't a lot of masks on in the crowd. And I want to just say from my own firsthand, like experience, no, there weren't like there, there were, there were not a lot of masks on in the crowd. Um, and you know, given the statewide vaccination rates or even the citywide vaccination rates, I was able to do some very quick mental math and go like, okay, that could potentially be a problem for someone the next day or the day after. Um, so I stayed in my mask the entirety of the show. Um, it was the, the thing that I texted you that you mentioned, um, that stood out to me was the second match of the night with the two women's tag teams, Naya and Shayna and Tamina <laughs> and Natalia. Uh, and that was emblematic of a trend that I really noticed in the crowd more broadly. So like during that match specifically, people in my section did not know who was babyface and who was heel. And there were a couple other people who were, you know, kind of like smart to the business that I was sort of chatting with a little bit throughout the course of the night. And then we even initially were like, I'm like, I don't know, like, who am I supposed to be cheering for this match? And we like kind of like looked at each other and chuckled because like it wasn't really clear. Um, you know, that also speaks to are they sweetening the audio? Oh, you betcha, they sure are. Um, absolutely. Um, but the other thing I noticed in, in the crowd here that like sort of rippled through the entirety of the night is that this audience happy to be back at a live sporting event. That does not mean that they are necessarily following what has happened during the pandemic very closely or are very tuned into the current stars that are being pushed. Um, what I noticed in the crowd was big nostalgia pops. They were really, 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 really excited when Jeff Hardy came out. Uh, the the Karrion Cross thing, um, I know everyone's been talking about it, um, it, it, it on one plane. thing that stuck out to me before we even got into the match was, oh my God, they're having him go against Karrion Cross because Jeff Hardy is over like Rover. Um, like p when Cross came out, there's a little bit of a murmur of like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. We got Karrion Cross. Then we went to a commercial break. Um, there was no Scarlet. People were kind of chattering about that. And during the break, it popped on the screen in the arena for all of us. Oh, he's going up against Jeff Hardy. And this crowd went bonkers baseball for Jeff Hardy just mm -hmm. by seeing him on the screen as a tease for what was coming out next. Um, and then out comes brother Nero and he is really, really, really over. So I think a big problem that WWE faces is that 
Um, it, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in greater detail on the next episode of Shake Them Ropes. But like, they don't have like the stars of today very concretely solidified. And insofar as they still have an audience for these live events, that audience is there for the nostalgia stars. Um, a guy who uh, I think will continue to get good amounts of money for a long time, so long as he can keep his body together, is Jeff Hardy. My word. Yeah, the the weekends I've gone to NXT and then WWE main event pay-per-views, it is night and day, the types of audiences that they attract. The WWE audience attracts families, and those families, the young kids like, they usually like the acrobatic guys, and the parents always like somebody who's been around for a long time. Like, I remember being at Mania in Dallas, and, like, the kids were waiting for the new day couldn't wait for the new day dad kind of goes man i really want to see the dudley boys <laughs> wwe Randy fans Orton tends to be a unifier for, yes. for this audience yeah how how was goldberg um actually less well received than you might think like yes. uh, yeah yeah it was it was a very very mixed sort of reaction for bill goldberg um it was not a uh overwhelming appeal uh to him i think people would have rather seen finn balor i don't think people were thrilled that keith lee lost how was keith lee received because I, I i made a comment that between aew and nx or and wwe was a tale of two different kinds of two different philosophies because keith lee from a nearby town to Dallas at least Dallas is kind of considered the biggest city near where he is considered a hometown guy loses only to get to Goldberg which probably should have been the other way around in my estimation if you really were, were thinking about this quite a bit but uh and then in and then you have AEW where Lance Archer wins the IWGP United States Championship in his hometown to end the show and it's like Vince would never have done this i don't think <laughs> no I, I mean I think that, that compare and contrast is perhaps the most obvious compare and contrast uh keith lee versus lance archer uh look uh, i think people wanted to see keith lee win and when keith lee came out my impression in the live audience was wow keith lee is much larger than bobby lashley he made bobby lashley look small and i thought it was a very weird pairing for lashley uh, it didn't make lashley necessarily look strong in the win um especially because he couldn't get the hurt lock on and it it upset the crowd especially for a build to a goldberg match when like look um i think people look back on that brief Goldberg title run with some fondness, but not necessarily look forward to more Goldberg and don't necessarily want more Goldberg. Uh, so I think Goldberg's a bit of a swing and a miss for this company, personally. It'll be interesting to see how he gets received in future episodes. Yeah, I agree. I think I think it's gonna I think they're gonna turn pretty quickly on him as well. I just <laughs> They've never treated Goldberg all that well until <laughs> until he came back the neck the, the the two times ago, I think it was. Uh yeah. And I think his rehabilitation was really possible because of WCW's really strong presentation of Bill Goldberg. So like in a lot of cases, what WWE was able to do to get Bill Goldberg back up to that star level, um, it had nothing to do with work that they had laid in in the first place. So we'll get to more TV takes after the news, but uh, let's uh, let's go into some of the things that interested us this week. I think, um, in terms of personnel, people moving around all over the place. Bodyslam.net reporting rumor that Daniel Bryan's going to AEW. Fightful reporting that Punk is in talks and that AEW is one of the companies there. Samoa Joe set to return to in-ring action for NXT we'll get into in a little bit about NXT and their relationship with the main roster because God knows what that is after Monday. Um, and the forbidden door has been open once again. Jay White appearing at TNA or at Impact's pay-per-view this past week. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, I got to so, take up the forbidden door, too. We'll get into that in a bit. But it looks like both Daniel Bryan and CM Punk are probably on their way to AEW. I suspect one makes a stop on next Sunday's Mystery Vortex at for Pro Wrestling Gorilla. Don't quote me on that, but I have a sneaking suspicion one might show up. Um, any thoughts on either of those two going to AEW? Because God knows the WWE stands dropped in my mentions when I said something as silly as, I wouldn't mind a punk Daniel Bryan, Hall Nash kind of dynamic. Not necessarily an NWO, but kind of a dynamic of, you know, two guys who are in there to quote unquote take over. And then I had had a certain wrestling personality try and bury me. I did not reply to this person. But uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, um, I think that the money with Punk and Danielson's debut is doing them together. Um, I would not, I, I wouldn't stagger them. I'd have them come in. Um, I, I think you, you need to target this, uh, and look, keep an eye on the ratings. If, if you think you're within striking distance of actually passing WWE and popping them on a specific week, that's when you play the card. Um, also obviously you have to have a program ready. So you have a program ready so that you can start, you can initiate the first chapter of that program on any given week. Um, I, I mean, Yes, obviously, it would make sense for them to do it at a big pay-per-view event. But given the way, look, I think there's some uncertainty with how many live events we're going to be able to run this year still. And so I don't necessarily think it makes sense to hold off indefinitely on Punk and Danielson either. I think if you're going to debut them, you want to debut them in front of crowds for sure, right? Um, and, and so, like, I would just, I would just go... There is some uncertainty in the future. Are we going to completely shut back down again? That's unlikely, but could you possibly have diminished crowds? Could you have increased measures, safety, go back to social distancing inside these arenas and get back to something kind of like what's happening in Daly's place? Potentially. And I think it would be better for a big debut to be able to do that in front of the largest house possible. Safety concerns aside. Samoa Joe becoming an active competitor for the next takeover. I I would much rather see Joe on the main roster, but I understand that Vince probably doesn't see a lot in him, to be honest with you. I I think he doesn't think that his body can hold up to, pal, we're running four days a week, which I don't see why you need house shows um, when everything on TV is all that matters. Uh, are you here for Samoa Joe and Karrion Cross as a match, Chris? Are, are, does that... Does that get you in the building or, or is it just, you want to see Samoa Joe murder death somebody, which is what I want to see. Man, I, this is the thing is like, I want to see Samoa Joe murder somebody. Karrion Cross has been fine. He's been fine. Um, he's an okay wrestler. Uh, it's an okay act. Um, I think it's been losing steam. I think uh, that they have lost interest in really making that entrance the next level. And it's been stuck at B plus a minus and has not been an a plus entrance at, at really at any point other than maybe, maybe that first week, if you wanted to argue me, that was an a level entrance. That's not for me. I didn't like, all no, the no, I wouldn't, I would never argue that. Cause that's when she was still lip syncing the entire song. I know. I know, but that was them thinking, how do we make an A-level entrance? I'll at least grant that. But okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. I didn't think it was A-level at that week either, but that was them trying. It seems like they've stopped trying to make an A-level entrance for Cross. And without an A-level entrance, this guy's a B-level dude. Um, he needs he needs that. Um, his M Mr. Regal... Uh, I'm going to deliver the, the harvester. He actually used a Metallica lyric. He said he was the harbinger of sorrow. Uh, yeah. Or the harvester of sorrow language of the dead. Uh, it was what I immediately like kind of chanted the second. It's 1987 and justice for all. Come on. Uh, I know. You get on board, get on board. Uh, Hawkins, don't leave me on the islands. Don't leave me on the islands. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, I'm not interested in cross um, Joe coming back. It's weird. It's like, I really like Joe. Uh, I'm interested potentially in Joe having a match with like Kyle O'Reilly, I guess, but Kyle O'Reilly has been so uncool. He's been cooled off Kyle. 
Um, so I'm like not interested in that. Bobby Fish, I guess, could potentially be a cool match, but like they they haven't built it up. It's not hot or anything. Um, Adam Cole and Samoa Joe. Look, uh, Adam Cole has been stuck at this upper mid card thing, and they're never gonna put the belt back on for a big long run again. He's not going on to the main roster. I'm not really interested in him fighting Samoa Joe. Um, so I guess maybe I'm not that interested in Samoa Joe. I, I like, I guess I, I like him. He's still good. Um, I just, NXT is a boring place for him right now. A little bit more on NXT in a bit. Uh, the former Aiden English now known as the drama King. Uh, he's been picked up for English commentary for new Japan and has also been signed by impact. Chris. And he's apparently running some local shows here in Dallas, too, because when I left uh, Raw, I got handed flyers for the Drama King Matt uh, appearing in shows coming up here in, uh, in my area. Good for him. I like him. I hope I hope he does well. I don't I, I'm not I'm not his biggest fan, but I think he was vastly underappreciated as both a wrestler and a personality. Yeah, time. right. Like, look, um, there's always going to be a place in this business for someone who can talk and act. And yes like literally the drama King Matt, like has that background. Uh, I mean, like, like, you know, the singing was being done for gimmicky effect, but like that is a legitimate talent that the dude has too. Um, I, I think he's a talented guy. Uh, I really do. Um, he's, I never thought he was like, you know, build the whole company around drama King Matt, but like this guy role in the business, whether it's a, a commentator, general manager, heel manager, um, any number of different things. Um, even you know, as uh, sometimes in the ring guy, uh, I think yeah, there's there's still lots of burn left for this guy. You wanted to go into the forbidden door. Now would be your chance. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, I think the positive spin on the forbidden door is it's now being opened through the business and uh, managerial wonders of places like Impact Wrestling, uh, Impact Wrestling, um, and also AEW. Uh, I want to throw out an alternative hypothesis. That New Japan standing in the world here since the year 2013 has been slowly diminishing. And that business over in Japan um, is far from certain um, that they've actually been having a pretty rocky run of things as of late here. And that the Forbidden Doors may be a little bit closer to an emergency exit than people realize. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is this one. This, this one we got to talk about because it's just so, so completely stupid and so completely on brand. WWE has trademarked complaining is not conversation for use in sports entertainment. Oh, are we going to get some Peter Rosenberg and Sam Roberts PSAs on the Peacock? Are we go Look, I... I get that there are people like me that complain a lot about WWE. I get that. And I get that there are people. I get that there are people who love WWE, who think it is the best product for professional wrestling that there's ever been, that they make real stars and they make easy to watch entertainment. That's fun and, and enlightening and other things like that. If you could, are they really going to go with, yes, the people who simp for us are the, are the people who are correct. Don't listen to all these stupid podcasts and all these websites and all these people who actually analyze and think about our product. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not a real debate. The real debate is, is Roman Reigns really head of the table? That's, that's a conversation that you and I must have as grown adults, as opposed to why does the storytelling stink? And why is the showrunner not listening to his actual writers who may actually know something about writing? No, no, no. That's complaining. We don't want negative. We want WWE to be a positive company. Positive Polly. That's us. Whoopie doo doo. Yeah, I, I mean, shut up and like it. I think fits on a T-shirt much easier. Uh, you know, I think it's catchier. You shut can't up and have like any it. pudding if you don't eat your meat. Shut up and like it. This, this is what we do. <laughs> uh, it, it, like, WWE now, then, forever. Shut up and like it. I, I mean, like, yeah, I, I come from the same land that you come from on this. Uh there has to be a place for negative feedback 
in the world of discourse and negative feedback is part of a conversation and the real question is does the negative feedback come from a place where you want the company and broadly speaking wrestling to fail um and you're here deriding it and mocking it and making fun of the fan base and the people who like it um that sort of negative feedback i don't think has a real good place and if anything i'd argue that sometimes wwe with slogans just like this trends into that sort of negative feedback and i think that like that that's not healthy but um watching a show and saying there are issues with their show and here are my issues with this show um and i'm someone who likes and loves wrestling and has you know who, who wants nothing more than to watch a better show uh i think there's got to be a place for that in the discourse um i you know i think like equally though jeff i just got i gotta stand up for it's important for us to talk about whether hold on, are not, you gonna stand hold on are you gonna stand up for wwe no i'm gonna stand up for the table <laughs> buddy oh you don't uh, no do we, you have, we have to we I, I i'll take us to task we don't talk nearly enough about the oh. table what it's made of how many chairs are at it is roman the head of it i mean you go back and you listen to the last five eight episodes of this show when do we ever actually talk about the table or even the dimensions of the table hey i bring it to the table every <laughs> i'm just gonna go through every old wwe trip like you don't oh you you you, pa- you kind of pass this by i guess you don't remember stand up for wwe do you i do remember stand up for okay, wwe I, I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't sure if you did okay yeah <laughs> bring it to the table oh but i could just see rosenberg you know these media dweebs that they co-op for a while like or, or, or rash marquezzi oh all cutting promos on us us dumb fans who don't know anything about wrestling yeah i, I mean like this this is part of wwe's broader problem though is how do you alienate fans who are on the edge right so if someone's quote unquote complaining they're still watching but they're not loving it if you want to finally push them out the door tell them complaining is not conversation which is in a in a sense saying what you are concerned about is not valid to me i don't care i don't want to hear it feel free to leave uh i I mean like why not put that on a t-shirt why not copyright that wwe feel free to leave Variety reports SummerSlam will be in movie theaters this year. Much like the AEW pay-per-views are occasionally in movie theaters as well. I can think of anything I would not want more than to have to pay double the price I'd pay for on Peacock and three times as much for snacks. But I guess if you like community, you can go watch SummerSlam in a movie theater. Chris, you going to your local AMC? Uh, No. No, I will not be going to any local movie <laughs> theater of any sort to watch uh, SummerSlam uh, this summer. Like, I mean, it just seems that's it's so much inside time. Um, like, I, it, it, I, you, you want to be able to move around. These shows tend to move a little bit slow and tend to have good 15, 20 minute downbeats where you can like, if you're at your house, you can make some food or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it, it, I just, I, I would never... Look, um, I like the option of being able to use my own bathroom and going to the movie theater in and of itself is like that, you know, that's right out the window. Tonight, WWE announced that they will hold a pay-per-view on Saturday, January 1st, 2022 from the State Farm Arena in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Atlanta is a fun place to spend New Year's Eve. Don't get me wrong. It is. Saturday, January 1st is a terrible night to have a pay-per-view. Chris, do you know what happens on, on January 1st at night? The college football playoffs. <laughs> the, the first two games of that. This is, no, they're going to get killed. Are they kidding me on this? But they announced this at uh, Rolling Loud that they're going to be doing that. So I mean, you're even going up in, on a certain level against whatever the new year's eve parties are and the recovery day after new year's eve um i mean a lot of people take new year's day as a day to unwind um recover from being you know uh let's say very uh jovial the night prior um and how interested is someone going to be in going immediately to SummerSlam on new year's day i don't know i don't know College football owns the day. Don't go against it. Uh, 
finally, in my news out notes, uh, WWE this year is going to have a Queen of the Ring tournament. Who wins, Natty or Charlotte? <laughs> it, it's got to be it's got to be Charlotte, right? Uh, I mean, it's Charlotte, and it's like Rhea Ripley and Charlotte in the finals. Here's the thing: I think they give it to her, and this ties into what happened on Monday, which is a ridiculous show. I think NXT is has been retconned from main roster WWE. Now there were a couple mentions of NXT UK for Tony Storm, and and McAfee, who is just who's always going to go off script, mentioned NXT. The problem here is, I don't know if you noticed this, Chris, but on Monday, they took away two of Charlotte's title reigns. They no longer list the NXT titles as part of those title reigns. They didn't mention NXT when Finn Balor came back. They take the champ out there with his title belt, not as a main roster debut, but as the NXT champion, and they have him... They have Jeff Hardy cheat to beat him in under three minutes with a roll up and his feet on the ropes. Chris, I just have to ask, is NXT just persona non grata in the world of Vince because he hates losers? Um, I think we're really sort of like jumping one extra step to assume okay. that he has... I don't know that I've seen enough evidence to conclude that Vince actually has decided that NXT is a loser. I, I'm familiar with this narrative. I'm familiar with the case of why NXT might be perceived potentially as a loser. Um, I'm somewhat receptive to it. I think that like it's a little bit more of a mixed bag than people realize. Uh, for example, NXT, I think, did have a great success um, or many great successes around 2013, 2014, 2015 in getting key talents from New Japan Pro Wrestling into the WWE fold and keeping them away from helping launch either a New Japan expansion into the United States or launching a really strong breakaway brand. Shinsuke Nakamura, um, I think it's easy to forget now, given the SmackDown title reign uh, that didn't ever quite get off the ground. Shinsuke Nakamura leaving New Japan Pro Wrestling was like a world level star and he could have came over here and been mondo um prince devitt was the top gaijin in one of the hottest factions in the world um the bullet club and nxt was able to bring them into the fold and however you feel about the pushes of either one of those guys during the nxt run or subsequently kept both of those gentlemen from ever being out on the market and being available for an AEW. Um, and you could even argue further um, by getting Nakamura in and then duffing him so badly, you heard his sale value to the point where Nakamura couldn't be that Mondo draw like he is when AEW launches. By the time AEW is doing all out, Nakamura is a shell of what he was formerly perceived as in 2013. That's only five years later. Um, so I think that was actually, in a weird way, a competitive success for NXT. Um, ditto with signing Adam Cole. Adam Cole's a guy that AEW absolutely 100% would love to have, and they don't have him right now. Kyle O'Reilly, they got him from Ring of Honor. Kyle O'Reilly is a heavily pushed main event guy. Um, you know, like NXT did a good job locking down many of the independents. Um, now, whether or not Vince appreciates that, perceives that, I don't know that either. Um, Vince might only look at the ratings failures of NXT against AEW and conclude that that's what NXT makes NXT a failure. And if he does that, I mean, like, look, uh, if you're only looking at the ratings, oh, no, I, NXT's getting their ass kicked by uh, AEW. It's, and it's never coming back. Like, they lost the ratings war. Um, I, I, it is interesting, though, like watching Cross get beat, clearly they didn't care at all about Cross's streak in NXT. They don't care what that means to the broader booking and presentation of Cross in NXT. Um, I, I do. I mean, it makes you wonder, like, is this only temporary? That's kind of what maybe my gut says is like we're seeing a temporary disregard of NXT. Um, and maybe it'll get back to a stability point. But um, yeah, it does seem like NXT is kind of getting demoted the same way Paul Levesque got demoted quietly. 
I don't know. I feel for NXT because they're in a real no-win situation here. And don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll go back to you. The only guy who's really been great coming off of an NXT title run directly to the main roster has been Kevin Owens for the most part. Everybody else has had hiccups along the road there. He's another but, guy who, if he was in AEW right now, would I mean that would be another thing that takes their brand up to a next level? If, yeah. If all, in the mix there, I mean, he's either a top baby face going up against Kenny Omega and all of that, and he's over like Rover with that crowd, or he is going up against you know like Adam Page or something like that and putting him over. And the Kevin Owens Adam Page match is really intense. Well, what I'm I'm thinking here is is something I tweeted earlier today, and that is they are stuck between two different difficult propositions. Number one, when they went to USA, they ceased being, and even when AEW, this is also part of AEW beginning, they ceased being that kind of cool super indie that people loved, that, that you'd go to and the takeovers would always be hot fire and the booking would make sense and be like a one hour show, you'd sit down, felt like good pro wrestling. Now it feels like there's a lot of, there's a lot of main roster cooks uh, making this meal with those ingredients right now. Yeah. And those ingredients are of a lower, more kind of like thinned out quality. It's like the cornstarch and stuff gets added into the recipes. And back when it was one hour, it was punchy. I mean, they, they, there used to be NXT episodes that were beginning, middle, and end, just like great episodes of wrestling television and made you believe that like good wrestling television was achievable. Again, that moved at the pace of wrestling television that I liked back in the day. The other issue is that they are not, for lack of a better term, getting, I don't know the inner workings necessarily. I could ask about this, but there is no, Roadmap, they they are, I'll, I'll give you how I'm, I'm viewing this. I work for a company, but I work for a division of that company, but the rest of the company has no idea what that division does. And there's no way for me, if I were ever promoted to any position within the rest of this company, to know what the hell I was doing. NXT is not getting guidance from the people at WWE as to what they need to do to make these people successful. Everything that they do for these NXT characters is in this NXT world, which the guy who's show running the two shows on the main roster isn't watching NXT. He goes down, he looks at people. These people look good. This person has a hook. Oh, there's a tank. I can do something with that. He doesn't understand these characters. And once he gets them, he just is trying half the time it's just crap that goes against everything they built this character to be in NXT. See, for example, Bailey, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, if you want to go uh, there. Uh, how dare you disregard Knox? Sammy Zayn, Knox. You know, all these people, I mean, you're better off even not getting pushed in NXT and he calls you up. Because those people he does things with because he just decides I can reinvent them and nobody knows what they were before. Carmella, for the most part. Alexa Damian Bliss. Priest gets saddled with Damian Bad Bunny Priest. because he didn't get overexposed at NXT. Yes, but that helped him in, well, for now. You know, Even Elias, to a point, wasn't really pushed in NXT, and he was hot fire when he was first no, brought up. No, 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 no. He wasn't really pushed, but man, did they give him long matches that stunk back in NXT like he he was not good back in the day and then they called him up okay but what I'm saying is a company that wanted NXT to succeed would be able to go to NXT and say look this is what we want you to do for us and this is what we're going to do for you and we're going to spell out some guidelines so that talent can be successful going from one show to the next maybe we have a talent exchange of some kind Maybe we just make this its own. We, we make it a third brand that's actually in the WWE universe, whatever. But there's no guiding principle here. Nobody knows really. <laughs> Could you imagine if Vince goes and saw, let's say, Top Dollar 
What does he do at top dollar? <laughs> you think? Crime Time Part 2? You know, what does he do with Hit Row Records up there? You know, does he let them be them, or does he do what he did with, like, the Street Profits? Or even the New Day, if you want racial stereotypes across the board. Not that I don't like the New Day or the Street Profits, but there was a lot of racialism. I won't say racism, racialism involved in both those gimmicks. Well, even I, Bob- I, I gotta tell you, um, watching tonight's SmackDown even, um, look, uh, the way they chose to book the matches on the hip-hop show side of the SmackDown, um, I thought uh, w- was questionable. I thought it was questionable. I thought oh, it was perhaps a little I thought that obvious. was smart. I think it was on the nose, but it was smart. Yeah, a little At too a hip-hop obvious, festival. I thought. Yeah, yeah, too- yeah, yeah, yeah. Beat the white guys at the hip-hop festival. Look, uh, let's get the whitest white guy on the roster, Otis, just to really hit it home. Carmella, you seem to be a stereotypical white girl. Who, yeah, who, yeah, no, no, I, I mean... On one level, yes, I'm with you, Jeff. There's like a cynical smartness to it. On there another, is. I think you could have gotten the Street Profits over and Bianca Belair in a much more subtle way. That actually, you don't want to. You don't want to run the risk of turning the crowd against you by them oh. going. I see through this. I see what yes. you guys are trying to do here. And like it, that, this was very close, in my opinion. Oh, it was very close, and that crowd. <laughs> I'm going to give WWE props for this. I think WWE and AEW both did kind of cool things to get in pop culture this week. AEW has these, has this merchandise, which is a uh, AEW versus street fighter. And it has, you know, it has like uh, uh, one of them is a uh, Cammy versus Hik- Hikaru Shida, I believe is one of the shirts and John Moxley versus Ken or Guile. I can't remember which one, but I, I watched that with that's kind of cool. That's the kind of cool merchandise people would buy who are wrestling fans. That cool. I think WWE running rolling loud, it backfired on them. Don't get me wrong. They're cheering for Bobby Shimurda to come out. Don't get, I mean, the crowd turned on this. It was not the place to do this show, but it was an attempt to be cool. And that's something that they haven't done in years really is try to try to I gotta tell you the misread here is what needed to happen was a hardcore match because um I I, I'll tell you a game that I know is still very popular people Def Jam Vendetta Wrestling and and like yeah and 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 I think that like what they needed was the Street Profits in a hardcore match against somebody hitting people with trash cans and that sort of thing to get the show started um rather than trying to have a technical chain wrestling style match or the standard WWE near falls clap, clap, clap. No, no, no. This needs yeah. to be like a garbage fest. And like they, that, they can't, that they, was can't, they, they can't do matches pattern for five, for six and seven year olds in front of a hip hop crowd. That's the problem. They can't no, adjust no. the style. These are adults who have been drinking. They want, like, they want action, They want to fight. They want to fight. They want Vader and Cactus Jack to beat the crap out of each other. This is Road Wild, except a hip-hop festival. And and I'll tell you, uh, if wrestling's going to get back into the mainstream, it does need to figure out a way to work in front of audiences like this to remind people, oh, yeah, I remember going to see a wrestling show. It's a good time. We were at that concert. Those guys had that hardcore match. I go and watch some hardcore wrestling again. Um, in, in a lot of ways, hardcore wrestling is what gets casuals in the door. It can't be the entirety of the card, but like, you know, if you want to like have like a little like chicken popper, you know, like the good appetizer to get people into the restaurant, hardcore wrestling uh, and deployed in a smart way like this in front of this type of crowd, I think would have made a big difference. Some mozzarella sticks, perhaps? Yes. <laughs> what is your favorite you have to try oh it's got to be the blooming onion right like i know it's like ten thousand million calories but like that blooming onion the dipping sauce that dipping sauce is on point i've always been a fan isn't it just ketchup and mayo or mustard and mayo one of those two do I not ruin the magic of the dipping sauce <laughs> jeff ruins everything uh ice freezing cold takes on money in the bank 2021 uh i thought it was better than uh better than average 
almost good at time. At times it was good. Um, I had <laughs> like Charlotte and Rhea Ripley had a really strong match. I thought that was then ruined by them running it back on Monday. I, I could not believe they did that, but they, they worked their ass. That deflated that the crowd I, I, on Monday. Like when I was in the house, um, we were deflated during that main event. Everyone saw through that main event. No one thought that that was going to be like a clean, real match. And the worst part is that Rhea and Charlotte worked that match in a way that was distinctly different from the level of work that they t- turned in on Sunday. And everyone who had saw that match on Sunday was watching on Monday and kind of like, all right, all right, all right, let's get to the big final surprise. Like, like, uh, you know, people were seeing a cash in coming. Like, like it, there, there was a bit of a murmur. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah. A little, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here, here we, I'll give you just the quick and dirty results. The Uso on the pre-show, the Usos beat Ray and Dominic. <laughs> with the same way they beat him on or beat him on uh smackdown tonight the uh the shoes to the back to give leverage aj and omos beat the viking raiders and they're gonna rerun that next week or on monday as if as if we need to see that again lashley killed kofi by murder death charlotte and Rhea again strong match charlotte beat Rhea by submission i thought Probably my match of the night. If, if if the men's money in the bank was not my match of the night, Roman Reigns and Edge. I just thought they they overthought this way way too much with the ref bump and then Seth coming out and then Seth coming out again and Ed. Yeah, I no no bueno. No, there the there are, there are a lot of problems with the Roman and Edge match. Um, I mean they. Yeah, if Edge really can't go out there and just have a straight match, then he really shouldn't be in these angles. But um, the the amount of booking that they had to do around this, um, the the way that the referee was deployed really stuck out to me in a way that, like, normally someone has to point out to me later on or I have to catch in a piece of commentary later on, like, idiosyncrasies about the refereeing or whatever. But as I'm watching Roman outside of the ring – I'm sitting here going like, where is the ref? Why is he not watching this? Like, like you know, like it, he's outside the ring and he's pulling off the thing from the chair and he's getting ready to use it. Roman has absolutely no sense of urgency about this. He, even though he's trying to get a secret weapon um, so that he can use this re- weapon. I, like a lot of this match dragged. Uh, you never really thought that Edge was in any danger of winning this match. And... Uh, once you started seeing all the extras coming out, the problem with the extras is the extras almost guarantee for us, the audience who are conditioned to watching this stuff, that that means that the heel is going to win because the dust storm of the extras is what is going to contribute to the finish wherein the heel wins. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So I, I thought this was just like a boring match from front to back and, Edge is all right, but like the most interesting thing he could do at this point for me is cost John Cena the title at SummerSlam and turn heel. Um, like, I, I think, like, that's the way that they should get out of the John Cena match, is that Edge turns on John Cena um, and screws over John Cena for the title. Um, and then we build to, like, a match between Edge and Cena, um, where they both kind of cover up each other's flaws and we live in a nostalgia world. Um, because I, Edge is not gelling with the main roster people. Um, or if there are main roster people that he will gel with, we have not seen him work with them yet. Well, John Cena came out at the end of Money in the Bank, uh, supposedly to show up Roman Reigns a bit. Did, 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 did. Hell of a pop for him. Are we at the point where even the most jaded Cena fan is going to cheer him? Are we going to are we going to get to John Cena sucks eventually? Uh, the question is how much exposure does John Cena get? Like, do how how overexposed does he get? Uh, I think the Cena button is a button you can push sometimes, but not all the time. And I think WWE has a real problem where they find a button that they can push sometimes and think it's an all the times button. He is going to steal this Suicide Squad movie. I'm pretty sure of that because he's playing. <laughs> the thing is, he can't act really well. I mean, he does comedy okay. But like if he's doing like serious John Cena, like an F9, nobody takes him seriously. But the problem is 
he's people are taking him seriously in a serious role here. He's going to be super serious Cena, super serious Cena, and uh, nobody's going to be taking him seriously. So he's going to so he's going to be funny every single time. He's basically playing he's basically playing a rogue Captain America type. He's peacemaker is a guy who loves peace so much he'd kill for it, literally. So so he's just going to be uber wound tight. <laughs> And everything you say is going to be uber serious. And everybody's going to look at him and go, you're a friggin' nut job. And it's going to be funny and great. Your two briefcase winners, Nikki A.S.H. And Biggie. After, after a cast of thousands comes out and takes out uh, Drew McIntyre. So we get to Monday. We get to your show. Do you have the Raw in front of you by chance? Oh, I do I, have... I will, I will yes. vamp a bit if you don't. Yeah, so I, one do. Briefcase, I, I do. Okay, one briefcase has already been cashed in. That is one Nikki A.S.H. Cashing in, becoming the women's champion of Raw. I thought for sure after this Raw, which was insane, and we've gone over a lot of the insanity already, but there's still yet more to go over. Nikki comes down, cashes in the briefcase, Rhea gets pissed at this, gives her a big boot, fails one, two, three. That would have been the perfect ending for this Raw. But alas, Nikki, who is very loved by her peers, is your Raw Women's Champion if she can keep it. I don't think she can keep it that long, Chris. This is an easy come, easy go situation. Nikki Ash's finishing move is a flying crossbody from the top ropes. Nothing screams to me transitional champion more than the finish of I just do a plancha off of the top ropes. Uh, I fly. Yeah. Um, like that, that. It'd be like if her finishing move was top rope body splash to a laying opponent or like elbow drop number two. Um, you know, like, like one of the generic finishes on like the WWE video game. I just don't see Nikki Ash as being a long-term champion. I don't think they're really interested in pushing Nikki Ash as like a real inspirational story for the kids or whatever. I don't see Nikki Ash having a lot of great programs or a lot of great people to go against. Bailey might be a fun one. If Bailey came over to be like a villain to Nikki Ash, Sasha might be a fun villain to Nikki Ash. It might be a fun vehicle the longest term situation i could see jeff is that wwe realizes that they could have some fun turning all of their characters into slight like villains like alexa bliss plays into her like she has a like she has a rogues gallery like batman or something and and whenever they're in their program with nikki ash they get to lean into being like the joker or the riddler or the penguin or what you know like hold on i want a legion of doom like, I want like the Hall of Doom to come up from a swamp, and I want that semicircle of chairs around a table, and, and you know I want Oscar, I want Alexa Bliss, I want Dewdrop and Eva, I want Shada and Naya, you know, <laughs> and who is the Lex Luthor? It has to be Charlotte. Oh, and Charlotte and Rhea are there. And then how are we going to? Ba- Bailey's absolutely the Riddler, right? Like ba- Bailey's a classic, the Riddler. She's the Riddler, but like Eva Marie is like Toy Man, who's like just dropping clues as to everything that they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Dewdrop is Solomon Grundy. Sasha is Two Face. <laughs> or Alexa is Two Face. She could she could play both. Well, Alexa's uh, yeah. kind of doing a jokery thing right now, so I was just gonna kind yeah. of move, yeah, yeah, move her quickly into the Joker realm. <laughs> How are we going to face the super friends? Although then, then Nikki would have to assemble her own team and probably be like, you know, <laughs> Bianca Belair. She, uh, Bianca Belair's hair gets even longer than before. She can use it as like a lasso. Would use it to like pull herself up to high places and or strategically trip people um, or tie them all up. Like like when she catches Bailey and Sasha and maybe Dana Brooke, who's just a henchwoman number two or whatever. Oh, she can tie no. them all up with her hair. 
And no, it has to be her imaginary friend. So it has to be like that super team meat wad put up in Aqua Teen Hunger Force where you have like boxy brown and a toilet paper roll and an apple with a bite out of it. Boxy, oh, baby. So, so, which, so which member of the Legion of Doom does she lose this to? I think I, I know, but go ahead with a uh, guess. Reckless speculation. Uh, you know, maybe it's Charlotte. Maybe, may, especially now that we've erased a couple of Charlotte's NXT title wins, maybe this is a good opportunity for her to just get the title back real quickly. I'm thinking that I think Dewdrop may take it off of her just for the visual. <laughs> like she does the cross body and Dewdrop catches her, slams her. One, two, three. But speaking of this Legion of Doom, Chris, we have another new champion because of Monday. That's right. One Reginald Montgomery Aloysius Bechdel. The third. <laughs> the third <laughs> of the Hartford Bechdels. We summered with them at we summered with them once at their cottage by, <laughs> by the lake. Uh he is your new 24-7 champion. Because Naya has decided that she no longer wants that sweet, sweet loving of Reggie Bechdel. She got her hair did and everything. Uh, and then and then the Geek Squad comes out. <laughs> Kira Tosawa, who I love to death, but God love him. It just... He has to wait there they for the flips. They made him into a ninja, Jeff. They made him into a friggin' ninja a couple years ago, and like he's a like, bad ninja too. That's I know he stinks as one. Yeah, he's Chris Farley as a ninja. <laughs> but after some rough going and some rough choreography, flippy do guy. <laughs> he he is now your and I, I mean here's the thing with Reginald Bechdel the third right uh, his. Flippy Doos, yeah, he can do more rotations than the average bear, but man, he has a hard time landing them. And like when you have to take like Reginald's like spinny quadruple six fifty times a thousand uh, cannonball, you're also taking like a spinning butt to the chest at like twenty miles an hour. Um, like yeah, he like hurls himself at people. Um, I, look, some of his escapes are good. Uh, I think once you go to the twenty four seven division, you're screwed. Um, like you're basically hanging around and cashing checks until the next round of cuts. So, you know, I don't have, uh, much hope for old Reggie. Um, it's, it's weird. Again, anyone who can do that level of, uh, gymnastics or whatever, you'd have to think has some sort of viability in the ring, but, uh, I, I have not seen him put together anything in the ring thus far that that is good at least now he's wrestling men. He won't have to have these convoluted like inner gender matches um or, or maybe that's a tragedy um but his pioneering no, no, chris the real chris the real tragedy is we have been denied of the best of 91 feud between Shayna and naya which a main event in any arena any People arena wanted Shayna to break away like i mean the general that match on monday that second match with uh natty tamina and Shayna and naya Shayna was basically the only face in that match um, <laughs> and people wanted Shayna to break away from Nia. Uh, like that, you know, um, Reginald Bechdel has not been good for the division. Um, he's not been good for this pairing. Um, you know, he has not been good is basically the general storyline. Chris, Eva Marie is allegedly a trained actress. Would you like to deconstruct that Pratt fall that she took? <laughs> I mean, I, what really brought it home for me was the facials. Because um, what the facial <laughs> said to me, Jeff, was, wow, that must have been the manifestation of the supernatural. Surely that was the doll or something. And you could just see that. Eva Marie's face slightly moved ever so slightly, but like in that micro motion. 
I saw the entire story that was supposed to be there. Some would say with the more complete facialization. So the thing I want to say about Eva Marie, Jeff, you want to be critical. Um, Eva Marie is an economical actress. A lot of people use the entirety of their face to express a situation. Um, when, you know, distress. Oh, I'm shocked. What if you could get distressed down to... <laughs> Sorrow, you you know you're you're crying, you're feeling bad, you're like you're head in your hands. What if you get that down to? You know, I, I mean, I, this is the thing about Eva Marie. I, I I don't think she's a bad actress. I think she's one of the best that we've ever seen. Not since Rodney Dangerfield as Al Cervic in Caddyshack, where he takes the moment and goes, "Ooh, ow, my arm! Have I been that transfixed with an injury?" on the screen <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> she looks straight down to make sure <laughs> takes the pratfall no, the pratfall no was... of horror what so like no it's a ah. no just completely like oh i fell and i'm like really that's it like, like yeah you like god please tell stopped. me this was for, for my friends in the company, tell me this was a pre-tape, and this was the best take. <laughs> oh, what else was ridiculous on this? On this, uh, oh, Shanky, our boy, poor Shanky. <laughs> yeah, like okay, so this is actually a good one. Um, let me explain to you how this played in the house, right? People sort of understood that it was Jitter Mahal's birthday because they were doing the promo and everything like that. Um, and they did say 35 at one point along the way. But the live audience, at least around me, did not connect that the insane amount of chain sh or chair shots to Shanky had anything to do with something akin to like a birthday spanking or something like that. So people were like kind of confused and slightly horrified at how many chair shots Shanky was taking seemingly out of nowhere. Um, like to the point where like people were kind of like, huh? Oh, uh, and like when Shanky got up and his back was all welted up and stuff, it was like, whoa, that seemed like a bit much, especially because no one knows who Shanky is. Like, I barely know who Shanky is. I know who Shanky is because someone said Shanky and I'm like, oh, that guy's name Shanky. I don't know who the other guy's name is. Um, I know that the Jinder Mahal is two dudes. Um, that's all I need to know. Uh, Jinder Mahal stinks. And this feud stinks. And this is very bizarre. It's yet another miscue with Drew McIntyre. Uh, Drew McIntyre, who, of course, on Sunday night in Houston, um, people were elated when he was getting pulled out of the Money in the Bank match. He comes out and he does like his little. Remember when he got pulled out of the Money? People were thrilled that yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, no, I do. Yeah. Oh, they were thrilled about that? I don't. Okay. Yeah, people were, there were a lot of people who were happy that Drew McIntyre was not going to win the Money in the Bank because they didn't want him to uh they didn't want him to you know continue to be in the main title picture because they're done with the run and the drew mcintyre fatigue is still very much a real thing here um i, I like promos now stink i hate they to do. say they that do. He, he's doing the <laughs> top hat cane whoopie 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 whoop, you know doing mr entertainment i'm here to tell you all the story kids i'm i'm from scotland and in scotland we do we eat haggis and look at the Loch Ness monster we watch braveheart all day no and, and you know what he's doing too he's now like on uh, on on a future episode of shake them ropes wink um we'll talk about like heroes versus anti-heroes and how like anti-heroes are sort of like the late cycle of like a hero cycle where like you can't make a compelling hero in the genre anymore so you start moving to making compelling anti-heroes drew mcintyre is now doing anti-promos they're not normal promos that connect with a person on a regular level they're not dusty roads going i'm reaching out to you daddy i'm not trying to speak to you like they're not they're not trying to grab people and bring them in by the way I would I would kill for Drew McIntyre to throw a daddy or a brother in this promo. Drew McIntyre is now making meta commentaries about his own promo style, um, mm -hmm. like which is which is not a top level thing to do. And the next thing that I'm going to say is my catchphrase, and then you say your catchphrase. Like that's not cool. Like Stone Cold no. Steve Austin going, and the next thing I'm about to say is, and that's the bottom line. And then he goes, 
and that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. That's a tagline, mister. Uh, like, like, I mean, it would have been the lamest thing in the world. Lamest thing in the world. Um, that's like Vince Russo stuff. Um, and, and like McIntyre is not doing himself any favors when he does meta commentary on his own crappy promos. He'd be better served trying to get the best out of that crap he possibly can, which is not much, than going and making little snide comments along the way about what's missing in these promos. All I could think during the Shanky beating, the Simpsons episode, Homie the Clown, when he's at Krusty Burger pretending to be Krusty and the Hamburglar knockoff comes in and he thinks it's real. So he starts beating the crap out of him and the kids start screaming, stop, stop, he's already dead. <laughs> that also popped into my mind while I was watching that. <laughs> It's funny you mentioned that, yeah. Like, watching it live, I was like, Jesus. <laughs> Shanky, come into my office. We got a challenge for you. You're going to get hit in the back 35 times by a guy stiffing you with a chair. Now, this is how Stone Cold did it. <laughs> yeah, okay, boss. <laughs> just whack, whack, whack. And now everybody's just going to think he's the dude who got beat up with a chair. Oh, my goodness. If they uh, remember him at all. Like, I mean... This is, you know, here's the thing, kind of like, uh, I mean, we, we don't, we did, we do the carry across thing. We kind of sort of did it already at, at some point. Um, I think that the carry cross loss is in a way gimmick killing. And obviously Shanky was not like a guy with big plans, but like, this is one of those moments that it's so hard to come back from. Um, I, in, in so far as people remember you at all, they, they will remember you as Shanky, the guy who got hit with the chair a whole bunch. Um, like it's going to be. It, it it's like Nikki in the spirit squad sort of st- tough to come back from. The only other thing I had about raw was on carrying cross. He obviously needs Scarlet as far as this act. He is J a G just a guy without the hot chick. In I thought opinion. the interview was gimmick killing too. Um, as bad yeah. as the match was, having oh, yeah. the guy get into the ring afterwards and go, so Karrion Cross, you just got rolled up in like two minutes by Jeff Hardy, who's been under pushed and lost to Sheamus at a bar, yeah, like uh, uh, drunk driving. Why thing. are you a loser? Why are you a loser who you sucks? Say, and yet you're the champion. What is this? Oh God, that, that, I just. No, I, I mean, I I have expect them to do like a salvage job where Scarlet comes in, he quote unquote gets his edge back. But like, again, that's like starting down here. And I don't think Scarlet can pull him back. She's she's not proven to be that great of a promo. I don't think the tarot cards or any of that stuff is going to get over in front of a live audience. I actually could see the crowd crapping on that. Um, you know, she comes out and here's the card of death. Uh, I don't see people getting really into that. They're not the brood. Guys will will cheer for a hot blonde in WWE land. That's that's just the way that is. But <laughs> you know, we're we're seeing these articles. We don't know why we're losing viewers. We don't know why we're building stars. And then they beat Keith Lee on his comeback, and they beat Karrion Cross on his debut. And they're saying, oh, I don't know. <laughs> What's the secret formula, guys? Yeah, I mean Keith Dear Lee is it, Keith, you know Keith Lee. People were excited to see Keith Lee return, and then they saw Keith Lee return against Bobby Lashley, and they knew that like this was not the beginning of some like Keith Lee versus Bobby Lashley program. I think it, real quick. I mean, problem especially with these live audiences, you either have casuals who don't know who Keith Lee is at all, and thusly are not invested in Keith Lee as a baby face, and so don't cheer him on. So that's gimmick killing. Or you have people like myself who know and watch enough wrestling and understand this company well enough to know that Keith Lee has 0.0% chance of beating Bobby Lashley um, in this match. And that really quickly sours the house against some of these little moments. Um, And this is, these are the things that I was kind of interested to see in practice for WWE as they left the Thunderdome because they were very much in their own little intellectual bubble thinking about what does and doesn't work and what can and can't fill 10 to 15 minutes of live television time. Um, I think they might be getting a, an awakening here at some point. Uh, AEW was a fantastic show. <clears throat> uh, wanted to bring one thing up from it, uh, not go too far into detail, but yes, the second labor of Jericho is Nick F Gage. And I love this. I thought it was just going to be pinnacle people, but no. 
We're going to get some surprises in here. And Nick Gage is doing an old school angle. He is the mercenary. He has been paid by MJF, who he doesn't like, for money to beat up Chris Jericho, who will be doing the pain maker makeup next week, which I think looks ridiculous, but he likes it okay. But overall, outstanding show from AEW this week. Don't have a lot to say because Chris didn't get a chance to see it. So we'll move on from there. Neither of us watched NXT UK. I read the results. Seems like it was just a show. Looks like Ilya and Walter has been put off for a while. I assume Walter is on his way to the States. That's what I, I got out of that. But don't quote me on it. I thought Walter had like an injury of some sort. That could be it too. But I thought it, I thought it was kayfabe. I was... <laughs> He might have an injury. I don't know. I need to look that up. I'm sorry. Um, NXT. Remind me of this show, Chris. Go through the segments if you can, and I'll just yeah, a quick uh, yeah, we'll with, 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 with pleasure here. I I do like doing a little lead through here. Okay, so um, we have the show beginning with a recap of the drama between Samoa Joe and NXT Champion Karrion Cross. So this entire show, uh moves through carrying cross here and out comes joe joe says that he's gonna wrestle um and he's confronted by regal and regal's like oh you know you shouldn't be fighting carrying cross for reasons that are not particularly clear here like this i like regal i like joe regal like does not actually have a really great argument for why joe shouldn't be fighting carrying cross here and so it makes this interaction sort of weak to me chris joe was great here Problem is, after what they did to Cross on Monday, Cross on Tuesday should be coming into work with and kill people. He should be he need, killing he everybody he's he attacking sees. people all night. Like, like actually, yes. here's how the show here's how the show should have began. Carrying Cross, we see, is attacking people backstage and everything. Samoa Joe marches to the ring, calls out Regal, and like starts berating Regal of how long are you gonna let this go on? The whole deal was unless provoked, I've been provoked. Let me loose Regal. And Regal's like, no, no, we still have to hold on to order. There still has to be some sort of structure around here. Joe, management can't just go around and beat up everyone, even if the cross is insane. Um, like they needed to be rehabbing cross, establishing that he's crazier and more dangerous than ever. Um, I I'd even take like high level acts like Legato del Fantasma and hit row and have them running scared a little bit from cross. Don't I would take yes, I would ruin this entire card. I would have him take out at least one member of the announcing team. I would have him be a force of chaos on this show and just and just derail everything until Regal has to do something then. Oh, and then Joe comes out and calls out Regal again somewhere in the middle of the show mm -hmm. after this thing's gone off the rails for the third time. He goes, Regal, get out here. Are you trying to manage this place? Are you trying to have order in this place? Then let me do my job. And, and then have him call out Cross here. And then we can start building to that with, with, with more of a sense of urgency. But Monday night was absolutely murderous to this opening angle having any sort of heat. And then we, we got into our first match, which was Bobby Fish and Kushida versus the Diamond Mind. I, you know, it was um, fine. It was fine because the Diamond Mind lost. Yeah. Uh, they're your new heel act. And yeah, right. Like we're and fish and Kushida are a transitional team. They're not going to be together forever. So exactly. like, yeah. So like what you don't have the diamond mine lose to them. You have them win by like something dirty. Um, we have Frankie Monet coming out with Jesse Kamea and now also Robert stone and, uh, Manny Rose comes out and, uh, Frankie Monet has a match against, uh, JC Jane is apparently her name. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that was that. That happened. Frankie Monet feels cooled off as hell right now, doesn't she? From her debut, and they were building up the debut, and and, and this is as she's out. gaining momentum as a factional leader too. Like you know, uh, she's now taken over and hijacked the Robert Stone brand from Robert Stone, um, and she still feels cooled off. It's a very strange place to be. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's not clear what the direction is with her. Uh, next up, we had Kyle O'Reilly defeating Austin Theory, which this was actually a good match. Um, I, I Like, I enjoyed this match for what I, it was. I liked the match, and I liked the promo. I thought the promo was okay. I thought Kyle O'Reilly wasn't a great promo by Kyle, but it was decent enough to get me into the match. I want your knucklehead who's been talking over here to 
fight. Okay, great. I'm into that. Cool. Yeah, I enjoyed this. Um, They had a good match. The right guy won. No problem with this in the slightest. Uh, I thought that it was actually some good TV exposure for Austin as well. So, yeah, that's great. Um, God, this really stunk. The Once again, the Legato del Fantasma annual mariachi musical, madness musical, was canceled by by these degenerates in Hit Row. Um, this is an event that I look forward to on an annual basis, Jeff. Uh, 2020, of course. No, no, hold, hold on. on. This- you hold on. 2020 was canceled because of COVID. I've been waiting all year for 2021's Mariachi Madness Musical and out comes Hit Row. No, he had the mariachis in the ring wearing the masks of the other two, and then he let them go. He let them go. He didn't. He he canceled it, Chris. It was not Hit Row, and then Hit Row came in and spoke more Hit Spanish than Legato. He canceled it because they're jerks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, like, I, I Santos was – very excited to bring it back just like the fire festival uh and yeah so you know like well, yeah well, what, what kills me is they're deathly afraid to show native spanish speakers speaking spanish but hit row comes out here <laughs> and they, they can cut entire promos in spanish to, to the act that, that are the supposedly the native speakers I, I, you know, I died my, at that. But, like, moreover, um, I do, like, look, uh, putting the humor of the Mary Ma- Mariachi Madness musical, like, I just, like, love that phrase, um, to the side. It speaks to WWE not understanding how to present Latin American stars. That, mm-hmm. like, your move is, let's go back to mariachis. Ha-ha, luchadors and mariachis. That's what Legato del Fantasma does. Rather Rock than, like, have, <laughs> yeah, rather than having these guys – be cool and like like essentially hit if you're gonna have hit row be the f- faces in this feud against legado del fantasma legado del fantasma almost have to be stuck up and hit row have to be more real um and so what legado del fantasma should be doing is not goofy stuff like a mariachi musical but like having like a very cool club scene or whatever and santos is looking very cool and demure and in comes the hit row people and they like disrupt this very cool and demure and classy sort of environment um and then they you know they do cool stuff um and you get over hit row and like establish that they are you know, terrorizing the place and like, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of structure you try to put on, they're going to be the structure. Next. Um, next up, we had Odyssey Jones defeating Andre Chase in the breakout tournament. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Odyssey Jones will be on the main roster within two months. Yeah, and they won't know what to do with him. So exactly. You know, yeah. Oh, we'll make him Mark Henry. Jo- oh, Mark Henry's not here anymore. <laughs> Drake Maverick de- uh, defeats LA Knight in a non title matchup. So, like, this million dollar belt really means something. Uh, I liked the angle and I liked the match up until the end where LA Knight had to get his heat back and it just looked like the dumbest. Th- it made Maverick look like the biggest moron on earth and yeah the 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 butler gimmick ain't 1984 anymore unfortunately it's not getting over with me no it's not getting over with me and they were like let's update it let's like let's not have cameron grimes be the broken baby face let's have him having too much fun as the butler and it doesn't work like like it actually like it, it the sort of baby takes the face whole... is it's su- the baby face is not supposed to be the guy who loses that kind of match it's supposed to be the heel who you know they did it right in nxt uk of all things with zaya and uh uh your your girl the one with the tv show it, it's effectively a 30 day Nina. break for whoever yeah. that heel is forever that yeah. heel is it's 30 days off Essentially, they get to be goofy. They get to do some. Yeah, no, it's Zaya Brookside versus Nina Samuels. Yes, like that was great. No, it's perfect. It's a nice little cooling off run. The heel can get their heat back. And that's what Nina Samuels sort of did. Yeah, like and 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 it should be easy cheesy. Um, The two the two times I remember this in in territory wrestling was when Jimmy Garvin had to do the the one for for the Von Erics. And, you know, he, he has to like do all this yard work and all this manual labor and he's doing the gorgeous gimmick. So he doesn't want to get dirty and precious doesn't want to get dirty. And then they did the baby doll becomes, becomes Dusty Rhodes personal for 30 days. 
And that was done well because they humiliated her, and it was almost as if she was appreciating it. And then she turned the tables eventually on Dusty and Nelson Royal and stole a horse and rode away so that she wouldn't have to be the butler anymore. This thing is you're humiliating a baby face for more sympathy. But, but it, you're also just, not because the baby face is not getting humiliated. Um, like yeah. this is the worst part. He's like, "Oh, you're trying to make me look bad, but I'm gonna outclass it. I'm gonna make this." He's Tom Sawyering it. Oh, you're making yes. me do work, but it's fun. Um, and the problem with Tom Sawyer is that like it doesn't really work as like a baby facing project. <laughs> you got cats crossing the camera. What, what kind of joint you running here, Nov? Oh, uh, you know, one full of cats, the next- only type that matter. Oh, what's next? next? What's next? Next up is um, we got our matches announced for next week. And then we got into our main event, which was inexplicably Raquel Gonzalez uh, versus Zia Lee. Okay. The promo with Zia, or the promo with Raquel and um, uh, 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 my girl. I can't remember her name for right now. What's wrong with me? It's oh, it's late because this is the second show we're taping. Uh, who's with Raquel all the time? Dakota Kai. Team Kick, yes, Dakota Kai. It's a nice little little subtle facial expression on Dakota. She's turning sooner than later. Um, next two weeks have been taped, so spoiler alert. Yes, it's true. She's doing it. It's gonna be Dakota and Raquel, which I hate. Because I like this team as a unit. I like this as a unit. I like this the small, This is one of the big... few tweener acts that kind of works for me as a tweener act, mm-hmm. too. And, and I have my doubts about Raquel as a baby face, um, especially given the way we've seen Rhea Ripley work out as a baby face on the main roster. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I just... I think this works a little bit better with Raquel as the occasional baby face. And when she goes baby face, it's cool. But most of the time she's a heel. When was the last time they did a giant baby face? Well, because they try this all the time and they, and then always, they just always end up sucking. So they turn them back heel. Here's Big the other show, problem too. Your next, Ron, move, your next Sid, move is Zoe Stark, right? Like yeah. so your, your next move here is Zoe Stark. So like Raquel ultimately needs to be a heel. Um, yes. so she's I, the I champ. Yeah. she needs to be a heel. Who is she going to fight on the heel side? If she's a baby face, who's big enough over there? Nobody. That's just, it's just ridiculous. But this match, God bless Zia Lee. When Raquel landed on her, I said broken rib. Now it does not fear. She has a broken rib. She got the wind knocked out of her. Don't understand why they didn't just call the match right there. They restart the match and they have her take the finishing move and just, and she's in obvious pain. Was like, hey, you gotta suck it up and take this finisher to get Raquel over. You know, it's not that Raquel landing on her would would, would get her over as a powerhouse. No, no, suck uh, it up, Zayli. Really crazy, like it's so it's so obvious to me that Raquel just basically incapacitating Zia Lee, who had been a match stopper and actually had been getting over insofar as uh, not necessarily the way she was supposed to get over, but getting over as the person who's responsible for the stoppage of matches, Zia Lee going down to a match stoppage herself actually would have been very narratively satisfying. Um, I would have written it that way. And I definitely would have called it on the fly that way. Yeah. And then Joe wrapped up the thing and we saw Regal laying and carrying cross drives off in his car. Yeah. Joe force Joe Uh, foreshadowed uh, this at the start of the uh, night that he promised that somebody was going to be asleep at the end of the night. So when he said that, I was like, oh, it's obviously going to be Regal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, They'll do it. Next week, sir, ask us anything. I am on vacation. I may do a short update beforehand. If uh, if there's big news, I may call Chris and we might record impromptu. But uh, other than that, don't send questions. It's too late. Too bad. So sad. Still love you anyways. But, uh, you know, if you have a pressing question, just DM me. I'll answer it. But, hey. You I don't know. I, like, if people actually regularly sent in a mailbag thing, I could see tacking on a mailbag section at the end of the show. That could be kind of fun. Rob never wanted to do a mailbag. 
I don't oh, know why, why not? Why not? I, I don't know. Okay, send us questions. Because, maybe because not, like, not like next we're... week because we're not. Yeah, not next week, but like the week after or whatever. I guess send us questions. And if the mailbag thing starts seeming like a viable thing, well, I guess we'll do it. Why not? Nah, I hate people. I don't want to do it. No, no, <laughs> no you don't. You love them. Okay. Yes. Send all your questions to Chris at DWATG. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Send or them to Andy WA. No, no, that's no, it's fine. I'm not on Twitter that much like these days. So like I'll actually be able to just like kind of see him when I'm on. Um, so I'm at DWATG. The show is don't worry about the government at don't worry dot <laughs> don't worry dot TV. Uh patreon.com slash DWATG on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Spotify. Go and subscribe to all those places. Um and uh I think that's it. That's all I got. You can follow me at Crap Game 13. You can follow the show at Shake Them Ropes. We are on YouTube on Voices of Wrestling's network. We are part of the Voices of Wrestling network podcast for every type of niche wrestling love there. If you love every, if you love AEW, we have Everything Elite. We'll sometimes talk AEW as well, much to their chagrin. If you like the Japanese wrestling, we have Open the Voice Gate. If you just like talking wrestling music, we have uh, Music of the Mat with our friend Andrew Rich. Occasionally have a trivia show called Five Star Match Game. Whatever you like in wrestling, we got a show for you at Voices of Wrestling. Subscribe the entire network. We will see you. Well, no, we won't see you next week, but we'll have a show next week. So enjoy it. Bye.